everyone, and welcome to the panel on Lovecraft's films adaptations, basically. So, uh, I'll, I'm going to be moderating this because I don't trust Bill because he gets off topic a lot, and also Justin and you. So, <laughs> I just figured it would be the best and wisest course of action. And uh, plus, Rain and Lane, oh God, you know, what will happen there. So, uh, I'm glad Mark was always here. And, uh, that was my hope down this end. You hold down that end. So uh, uh, thanks for coming out and uh, whisper and everybody enjoy that. That was good. So, yeah, enough of that now. So uh, next thing is, uh, so the topic is film adaptations of Lovecraft. Now we're not including, I don't think, uh, documentary works in this. We're including specifically things that have taken his works and either extrapolated upon them or literally you know, adapt them. So I'll start at the end here and we'll introduce ourselves and then we'll tackle that. That question is, I guess, what do you think is the best filming adaptation? That's the first question. So as we're thinking about this, let's already introduce ourselves. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Justin Giallo. Uh, I'm a film projectionist in Porky Extraordinaire. And uh, that's about all there is to know about me. I'm not as awesome as these guys up here. So that's why I'm new to that's true. That's all true. So, uh, so my name is Jason B. Rock. I'm a filmmaker. I did a, a documentary about Charles Balance and one of them, I'll talk about the Forrest J. Ackerman. Uh, if you don't know who he is, uh, go look him up on Vanderbilt. And um, he's very important. And he actually knew Lovecraft in a tangential sense. Um, I also have done uh, other documentaries, an important one about Fantastic Art. And uh, I'm a writer as well, so it'll really be interesting to discuss that. I'm William F. Nolan, Logan's run man, and uh, they're going to make it finally at Warner Brothers, looks like next year, and we'll be able to see it in 2014. God knows what it'll look like, but it might even be good. <laughs> you might like to see it. I know, I don't think it will be in, yeah. Uh, Bring you in even if it's in an urn. Okay, I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll wheel the urn in. Good, so. good. Well, I can't answer your question because we have to introduce the rest yeah, of the gentleman here. Oh, so go ahead. Uh, I'm Sean Brandy with the HP Life Craft Historical Society. Yeah. Done a lot of Lovecraft adapting over the years, so. Uh, I'm Andrew Lehman, I work with him. Mark Laybaugh, and I uh, was just a writer. Just a writer. Just a writer. Get off. 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 So let's talk about the question at hand. And we will turn this over to, to question the audience in a moment. So, uh, uh, not in a moment, but no, no, right, no. probably after a very long moment. So okay. Some boring stuff. Taipei, a Spanish movie show. So, um, and so what I'm going to ask you is, filmmakers, you are looking at from the perspective of someone who's seen a lot of film as projectionists. Okay, so we'll think of it from that angle. But what do you think are the best filmic adaptations thus far of Lovecraft's work? Anyone? Alien. That's a problem. Alien. Now, it, it isn't formally a Lovecraft uh, adaptation. I mean, there's no credit to Lovecraft in the movie. But there's no doubt that, it, it, that Lovecraft had a tremendous influence on, on the whole film, from the aura inside the ship to the to the creatures outside, uh, Giger's uh, work, brilliant work. Uh, and to me, that's, that's as close to Lovecraft as you can come without actually basing it directly on a Lovecraft story. So I, that's my favorite adaptation. Go ahead. What's your? Well, now, now, you've, now that you've taken it up in direct Lovecraft adaptation, then we're going to have to go John Carpenter's The Thing. Because also, without being a Lovecraft adaptation, it's a, it's a very Lovecraftian film, and it's, it's yes. like a good film and on, on a bunch, by a bunch of different measures. How do you feel about the pre prequel slash remake aspect? You know, uh, that they're doing now? Yeah. You know, I haven't seen it, so I can't really judge it, but nothing I've seen about it inspires me with confidence. So, I, I, you know, maybe it'll be really good, but, I mean, but I mean, at least that. the way they're marketing it now doesn't even really seem like a prequel, it just seems like a remake. And, you know, what, messing with a good film is... Well, they're kind of talking, you know, it's kind of bold. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's, and it seems to be nice. So they started kind of rolling through with more trailers. They, they're like, oh, wow, well, they're, they're in Norway. But, you know, Not really. Like, really you know what I mean? You know, who, who, are, speak they, who are they and fuck them? <laughs> <laughs> because I think that that's one of the actual best Lovecraftian cinematic achievements ever. I mean, that really takes the vision. Why do you have to remake it? Or have ripple it even. I mean, I don't need to know the answers to every ripple. You know, I don't need to know the answer to why. How did the Norwegians react? Who cares? They died. You know, they found their investigated and horrifyingly stretched corpses. You know, and we know that what happened to the export. I mean, so and the same is 
true for, I think, anyway. You know, I mean, we don't need to know every single scrap of thing. That's only a monetary, you know, Hollywood kind of thing, I think. But, uh, what about you? Yeah, there was speech or well, I mean, you guys, right. have, okay. you guys have started with the bar pretty high, and I don't know that I can go over it, so I'm, I'm not going to name another one. one. I'm not going to say one is... The yeah, question was the best one. I think you named the two best ones, so I don't have a different answer. Well, uh, it, give us another one that you liked a lot. I mean, or how about for, for a real love yeah, Third or fourth or yeah, right, true, absolutely. Yeah, what, what, what film did not you like? Not uh, I guess I'm I'm going to go with the short film that I saw in Portland many years ago, which is The Old Man and the Goblins, which is a, a it's a it's a short puppet film uh, directed by Mark Caviero and Seamus Paul done in the style of the sort of German animated puppet films of the 20s. I found it inspiring. Um, it's not a direct Lovecraft adaptation, but it is definitely, um, as far as capturing the flavor of Lovecraft's time, I, I found it. Uh, well, actually, it, it stuck in your mind. What I was going to ask about that is, do you think the puppetry aspect actually lends itself to the unreality? Of I absolutely do. It, it had a very dreamlike quality. And I can definitely, definitely, I mean, I, I, I still think about it, and I still want to tackle something similar to it. And it's a, a specific aesthetic of the era, too. You know, yeah. it's, not, it's not a technology that's attempting in any way, shape, or form to be real. Right. It's like, you know, like, like uh, Japanese puppetry. You know, it's just its own aesthetic, but in that particular sense, it was, yeah. a, it was a good way to tell the, yeah, that story. Are you familiar with the concept of the uncanny valley? Sure. Okay, so there's this concept, I guess kind of philosophically, but it's a technological thing too, as things approach absolute reality as we engage in it day by day. It seems more unreal to us. Like CGI is a prime example, computer generated you know, animation. It seems uh, the more real it becomes, and very real, we, we kind of have this distancing mechanism where it seems like if that's fake looking, okay, even though it's incredibly realistically rendered and done, okay, and really you probably couldn't objectively tell it if you look at it frame by frame. But then the uncanny valley starts kicking in subconsciously almost and saying that this is not reality. It's apart from reality. But things that are totally unreal in actually engender the opposite reaction, which is the suspension of this point. Okay? And that's also a, the flip side of the uncanny valley. Do you think that's why it worked for you, that uncanny valley? Kind of thing where you can sustain your disbelief and go, well, I'm just going to go with the story. Versus well, there's nothing about it that's. Uh, the Uncanny Valley, in my understanding, is you know that that danger zone between you know obviously not real and real. It's never for a minute confused by whether or not what you're seeing is real. So the Uncanny Valley didn't turn into it, but it did have because it was you know this stop motion black and white. It was. It was extremely theatrical, and I agree that you know things that are very theatrical let you then let go and immerse yourself more completely into the world of the story because you you are freed from thinking about whether or not that can possibly be real. You know it isn't, so you can just immerse yourself in the, the world of the story. And that worked very well. That. The brother, the movies by the brothers Quay are also many of them have that same incredibly dreamlike, you know, nonlinear. You know, it's some of them are very creepy because now those some of those do into go into that uncanny valley territory for me, but but they are also you know so some of them surreal and bizarre. I think the uncanny valley too phenomenon. No, I don't even make point of it. That it's objective in one sense, actually it's measurable. You know, where as it approaches more of a human-like aspect, it becomes like where you start rejecting it more. Versus, you know, it's subjective too because one person in uncanny valley is not. The threshold might be slightly different from first impression of the world. Pretty much for Robert, the neck is the best thing. That's called the stupid mount. Uh, uh, the stupid peak. So, go ahead. Oh, uh, well, I was just going to say, as an example of that, uh, I would in the QA after it was where I was talking about uh, King Kong. Right. And I think the yeah, the Okay Valley is exactly, exactly what that's about, is why like the little you know, 18 inch high puppet Kong is awesome in how it does its illusion and the giant digital hair perfect style, you know, virtual Kong in Peter 
Jackson movie for me was not remotely as interesting as that little there's fascinating puppet movie. In fact, there's an emotional rejection. Yeah, you know, yeah it's, absolutely. It's, it's alienating. It is. It, it, it is off And insane. I think also, I know Ray Harryhausen, because we interviewed him for Forrest J. Ackerman, and he's a great guy, a real sweet guy, and you know, he was effectively put out of work by CGI, essentially. And I love Clash of the Titans and you know, things that Jason the Argonauts. I'm actually named after Jason the Argonauts. <laughs> and so I love the fighting skeletons and stuff, and it's totally unreal. But man, I'm like there in the moment. And it's kind of a zen like aspect. You're, you're right in the moment with it, and even though it seems to die, if you look at the contextual, it's like, oh yeah, fighting skeletons, that seems kind of stupid. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? They hold it together, and then what I mean? You know what I mean? Oh, what, how are they eating? And, you know, I mean, you start to think about it logically. You're like, this is dumb. You know, it's just like king of pain here. You know, the challenge is going on crust bread. But what the point is, when you start getting into like, yeah, every hair being rendered by all right lure, you know, on a CGI screen, it really gets, it, it becomes not just a rejection emotionally because it's so perfect, because nothing in reality is perfect. It also becomes kind of boring and tedious to look at, you know, and your eye fatigues on such things because you're kind of, I think, maybe unconsciously taking it all in and analyzing it, you know, and saying, is this real, is this no, and constantly comparing it back and forth. And I think that you don't have that problem when you have things like the Viking Skeletons or the Titans or, you know, uh, King Kong. Or King Kong, the really. Yeah. Because that gives you, your mind, that mental space and distance. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a big failure in Jackson. I'm in complete concurrence. I was thinking that when you were saying that during that Q&A. And I think it's, uh, it's a shame because everything's going more and more that way. You know, but I'd rather watch 1980s Clash of the Titans than the remake. I mean, the remake is my wife, Sunny, <laughs> she called the remake of Clash of the Titans, I don't know if anyone's seen this, a nutsack with no testicles. <laughs> and so I was like, well, that's very evocative in a statement. And uh, I can understand kind of what she's saying after she explained it to me. I was like, what do you exactly mean by that? And what she was saying was, it has no heart, no soul, nothing's to it. There's nothing interesting, nothing edgy. But it's perfectly rendered, and that's, I guess that's okay, you know, for if people like that. And I feel bad, actually, for children today. I mean, where's their imagination going to go? Because there's no, nothing for their imagination to fill in. There's no imaginational gap, you know what I mean, for them to kind of bridge and, and say yes and engage their own intellectual curiosity and imagination. Now, Mark Playboy, you've been silent. Um, the Resurrected has been mine, partly for that reason, because uh, it did the super daring thing, of, the Lovecraftian thing, of basically filming the climax in the dark. And so much We're going to show a version of that tomorrow. We are going to show a version of that tomorrow. It's going to be Dan Abandon's, I'm going to interrupt you one second, it's going to be Dan Abandon's original director of work crimes. With his edit marks and everything on it, a la Stan Brackage, you know, like documentarian. With no soundtrack except the actors talking and, and some sound effects. And even gaps in the film where they're singing and stuff that's supposed to go here and they actually come up with special effects go here. You know, now there's some in there, but it's interesting because of that. It's his vision of it, not the one This is a copy of Flight from his own possession. He gave it to um, and then last wave is showing here tomorrow, which yes. in the age that I was when that came out, which I, was, I think I was a uh, freshman in college, and there being no Lovecraft, Lovecraft as a pop phenomenon did not really exist, so it was just one nerd to another. You know, Lovecraft is good. Okay, now we can talk. But uh, at that point, there was not a code. There was no quality of the games. There was no percolation of Lovecraft outside of the um, so what you, I mean, there was the Haunted Palace, there was Corman movies, there was some stuff you could see. Uh, What's that Karloff one? It was sort of Die Monster Die. Die Monster Die, where it has a great moment at the end, it's super Lovecraftian, and you see the creatures. It's, it was about showing a vision of sort of Lovecraftian than anything at the same time. But what you looked for was something that um, you wanted that same cosmic chill that you got from Lovecraft. You to take it wherever you could find it. And for me, when I saw The Last Wave, it was just like this shock of recognition, like, oh, it's the same thing, it's deep time. It's this, it's like you find you're part of something that doesn't care about you, but it's this huge cosmic pattern. And 
that, that to me was a movie that felt Lovecraftian at the time I saw it. It had to give me the same kind of buzz. So it's not specifically Lovecraftian. I have no idea if Peter Weir was into Lovecraft. But his other movie felt like a Robert Aitken movie. Mm -hmm. uh, Picnic at Angle Rock. It's like, so if you, some people are tapping into the same thing. I don't necessarily need to require it. You see that happening over, based on over a long period of time. You see what's happening kind of the same mindset. I think Cosmicism, in a way, is an introspective thing. Uh, it's a way of tapping into the primordial the infinite self, you know, that we all have. And I think that's why it resonates. I was reading in an Amos Vogel book called uh, Film as a Subversive Art, which I gave you in a different term, but I saw you just wrote it off. And, uh, and so, so what happened is, you should read that book, it's excellent, but Vogel points out that the more universal an experience is, the more taboo it becomes. For example, <laughs> there's a scene, I think it's in a Bunyel film, where there are people who eat in private and defecate and vomit in public, which is not what we do. You know, they do it socially. You know, they're like, how are you? You know, and then they, you know, you know, and all this. Where, and then they go, well, I gotta go eat now. They go in these little stalls and eat. Okay, and it's an interesting reversal of these universal functions because we think of eating as a social man. And our private bodily functions is something that is no one should be involved in. That universal taboo kicks in because all of us experience these things, but we want to keep them private and separate from ourselves to integrate with other human beings. And I think that cosmicism is kind of like that. The more universal we are introspective and think about how insignificant we are, in a sense, the more it expands our reality to where we're afraid of what is out there. And so we want to maybe find others that like us, or that are like us, that think about these kind of things and ponder, are we all just insignificant or is there a great purpose or anything like that? And I think that movies like The Last Wave and things like that kind of tap into that unconsciousness and unconscious thing. You know, whereas the ancestor slash the resurrected is very direct, you know, and he has a story there, but I think he's also trying to reach into the past and reach into our self. Things like that. How well do you think Lovecraft did that? Do you think that he utilized the information available to him at the time scientifically? Can I? No. <laughs> yeah, you can. Well, first of all, I want to say something first. <coughs> How difficult it is to adapt Lovecraft. And the reason is he's an or he writes in a, in, in auras. In other words, there's a there's a sort of a, a dark cloud over Lovecraft as you're reading him. How do, you, how do you create that feeling, that aura of menace, of suspense, of, of, uh, of nervous? You get nervous reading Lovecraft and not really knowing when he's going to encounter one of these things. In films, everything is too in your face. You've got the dialogue and you've got the camera working and, and there's really no, no way to be as subtle as Lovecraft is. And if you, if you remove the subtleness from Lovecraft and the aura from Lovecraft, you've got a rather silly bunch of people waving tentacles at each other and it, it all becomes sort of pointless. So it's a, it's a tough job. That's where there have been so few really good Lovecraft adaptations because he's a very tough writer to, to put on film. You know, reality is not subtle. That's the thing. I mean, just reality in a way is like film. Film is what you can see, what you can hear, what you can comprehend from what someone is telling you. And reality is a lot like that. You know, you can't always, you don't know what the other person's thinking. You're not privy to their thoughts and innermost, you know, drives and impulses. So, you I think in a way it'd be easy to interpret. Well, I wish Alfred Hitchcock had done Lovecraft because if you look at Vertigo, you'll see what I'm talking about. The whole mood of Vertigo is one of surreal suspense. You don't know whether this woman is a ghost or reincarnation of the same woman. And, and it's very spooky film. I mean, uh, he, he, he puts an aura of, uh, of, of darkness over that film that, uh, that no other director, that, to my knowledge, has ever achieved. That's why Vertigo is such a classic, in my opinion. Do you think there's a surreal element to Lovecraft? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I yeah. call for an extra real, <coughs> oh, yeah. real another dimension, and that's what films can't reach. They can't reach that dimension.